Hello, this is Matthew, CEO of Privacy Systems LLC. Today I'd like to share with you our first in-house developed software product for consumer privacy. This is the Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL for short, NextCloud installer. If you've been in the privacy space for a while now, you might have heard of NextCloud. Otherwise, maybe not, so I'll explain it real quick. NextCloud is an open source, privacy-focused, self-hosted replacement for other cloud services such as Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Apple iCloud, or Dropbox. Because NextCloud is open source and self-hosted, it means when using it, you can be pretty confident that some company somewhere is not spying on your files. When using a service like the aforementioned Google Drive, Dropbox, etc., etc., the company can look at your files whenever they want. This isn't just a conspiracy theory. It's been well documented and IT people know this very well. If you want to learn more about digital privacy, please visit our website, privacysystems.org. On the website, we try to break these topics down so that they're easily digestible by even people who aren't IT pros, and we link to our sources. So let's get back to NextCloud. In addition to just file hosting, you can do other things with it through add-ons. So you can even store your contacts securely if you want to, or even use NextCloud as a secure password manager. It's for this reason that many companies actually choose to use a self-hosted version of NextCloud to collaborate. Unfortunately, because many companies choose to use NextCloud, it seems like they have geared the documentation of NextCloud towards companies as reading through something like this is difficult to say the least for people that aren't familiar with Linux. And through the normal install method, you pretty much have to read through the documentation. On top of that, not everybody wants to go out and buy a Linux server to run their own NextCloud instance on. It's just not convenient enough. Additionally, to back this up automatically with a service like Backblaze, you would have to pay for an additional business license as you can only back up Linux computers using a business license. The same goes if somebody rents out a Linux server from somewhere. So until now, the standard method to set up a personal NextCloud instance that is backed up with a service like Backblaze automatically and with no additional cost would be to purchase a NextCloud virtual machine image from a third-party company and run it under virtual machine software within Windows allowing the automatic Windows backup license you paid for to automatically backup NextCloud as well. Unfortunately, this method also has many drawbacks. For starters, you have to know how to use networking within a virtual machine environment. And also, the company that makes the virtual machine images, it looks like they make you pay more depending on how much space you want to reserve on your drive for NextCloud. The biggest downside of them all, though, is that running a full virtual machine under your Windows operating system uses up a lot of system resources in the background. This is less than ideal if you want to be able to use your Windows computer for other things throughout the day, and I would think most of us would. This is where WSL comes in. The Windows subsystem for Linux is a compatibility layer for Windows 10 and 11 that allows you to run Linux apps on Windows. It's faster, integrates with Windows perfectly, and uses less resources in the background than a full virtual machine. This makes it an ideal candidate for running NextCloud under. There's only one small problem. WSL is not exactly like a full install of Linux, and so if you try and follow the NextCloud installation documentation exactly, under WSL, it's not going to work. There are permissions issues running it under WSL. There are auto start issues. There are networking issues. So installing NextCloud under WSL would normally not be an easy task. The point is, Privacy Systems was founded on the belief that everybody has the right to privacy, not just IT experts that know how to do all this stuff manually. That's why we created this script that automatically does all the installation steps found in the NextCloud documentation, and it also fixes all the issues that come with installing it under WSL. This means everyone, regardless of technical knowledge, can have their own ideal NextCloud private instance. And your NextCloud size is only limited to the data capacity of the drives in your computer. Our installer also goes above and beyond and automatically fixes any issues that might otherwise appear in the security and setup warnings page of NextCloud. And it also automatically configures NextCloud to use PHP 8.0 and the Redis MIM cache for optimal performance, as well as MariaDB and the cron scheduler for the best third-party app compatibility. These things are things most people wouldn't even bother with on a NextCloud personal instance because they just take too much time to set up manually. Finally, 
finally, our installer also walks you through setting up secure remote connections through, say, a domain name like nextcloud.example.com. This allows you to securely access your Nextcloud instance even when you're off your local network and when you're roaming about. Our installer works on Windows 10 and 11 and it is available on our website for digital download at privacysystems.org. Links are in the description below. The more technical Linux users who are watching this might be thinking, oh, well, why don't you just install Nextcloud through Snap? And well, the problem is, Snap doesn't work under WSL because WSL doesn't use systemd. And you can get systemd working under WSL, but it breaks pretty much everything else. So with that out of the way, I'll do a live install here for you just to show you how easy this script is to use. First things first, you need to make sure your computer even meets the requirements to run WSL in the first place. And you can do this simply by running the script. It'll tell you up front if you have hardware virtualization enabled. And if not, it will direct you to this page here that will tell you how to enable it. Next up, you'll actually need to install WSL and the script will remind you to do this and it will direct you to this page that tells you how. Now that WSL is installed, it's time to run our script, but we can't do so until we tell Windows that we want to allow it to. This is because our script isn't signed, but you don't have to worry about it doing anything malicious because while our script is not obfuscated in any way, shape, or form, in fact, if you know how to read PowerShell scripts, you can open it up to see what it does. So in order to allow our script to run, we have to open a PowerShell terminal as administrator and type in this one command and hit enter. This changes Windows policy to allow us to run PowerShell scripts that were downloaded from the internet. If you wanna set this back to default when we're done running our script, you can run this command again at the end of this process, but instead of using bypass, use the term restricted. Another good thing to note here is that a quick way to open a PowerShell window as admin is to just right click the Windows Start button and you'll see an option there to do so. Now that we have hardware virtualization enabled, WSL installed, and our execution policy set to allow PowerShell scripts downloaded from the internet, we can just double click the script to run it. And you want to allow it to make changes because this is where it elevates itself so that it's running as an administrator. The first page is just here to remind you to have WSL installed before continuing. And the second page here is where you choose the Linux distribution you want to install under WSL. So far, the script supports Debian and a few different versions of Ubuntu. The Nextcloud developers recommend running Nextcloud under Ubuntu, but in our case, we're going to choose Debian because it uses less system resources in the background. This will download the distro of choice from the internet if it's not already downloaded and open it for the first time here. As you can see, we get a new window that says it's installing, and then we're just going to choose a username and set a password in this new window. We'll just use the username Nextcloud here for testing purposes, but you can set this name to whatever you want. This won't be the name that you use to actually log into your Nextcloud interface. This is just for your WSL distro. After that, our command line is freed up and we can exit out of this window and go back to our script window. We'll want to hit enter to continue on this, and then it's going to ask you to type in that password that you just set into the script. This way, the script knows your login information for your WSL distro so it can accurately run the commands. If you mess this up, the script won't know your password so it won't have the permissions to run all these commands properly and therefore the install is just going to fail so you want to make really sure that you do not mess this up now that that's done the script starts by updating your wsl distro as much as it can before proceeding with the next cloud install you'll just want to let this run the process is going to take around 20 minutes or so before you get the next prompt in our script for the purposes of this video, I've been fast forwarding. This next prompt that you get will be where you actually set up your login information for Nextcloud. So I'll just set a test username and password here real quick. I hope your password is stronger than my test password. Once we're done with this, we're only going to have a small wait until the next prompt. This is where you'll be asked your region code. This isn't super important, especially if you're not using phone numbers in Nextcloud, but you will get a persistent warning if this value is not set. So if you don't know how to set this value, just follow the instructions and visit this Wikipedia page to figure out your region code. For me, my region code is US for United States. So we'll just enter that in and it will continue doing things here. Now it's going to ask us if we want to set a data directory and we're going to type Y for yes and hit enter because if you leave this default, you'll get a warning about it sometimes. 
Um, so it's highly recommended that you change this from default. And in my case, I don't want my data being stored on my boot drive. I want it on another drive that is dedicated for NextCloud, drive G. So because your Windows file system is accessed in WSL through the MNT directory, we're going to type forward slash MNT forward slash G for drive G to create a NextCloud folder on the root of our G drive. You'll want to choose a location on a drive that has a lot of free space because if you're using Nextcloud a lot, this Nextcloud directory is going to fill up pretty quickly. You shouldn't manage your Nextcloud files directly through this directory because when you add a file to it this way, Nextcloud doesn't know that you've added it. So the better way to do this is through WebDAV and the text file included with the script explains how to set that up if you want. Finally, we're going to get a prompt that asks us if we want to allow remote connections. In our case, we're going to say yes to this because if we say no, our Nextcloud instance will only be accessible from within our local network. In order to say yes to this, your internet router must support port forwarding and you also must have a domain name. If you don't want to pay for a .com, .org, or whatever, you can simply sign up at Freenom for a .tk domain and there are other free domain names as well. If you meet these requirements, you'll need to add a DNS record that points your domain name to your external IP address of your internet router. This type of record is called an A record, and you can see an example of it here. This A record I've added points the subdomain nextcloud.privacysystems.org to my external IP address, which I have blurred. To find your external IP address, you'll want to log into your internet router's admin interface, and the information on how to do so is normally located on a sticker on your router. Once you're logged in there, you should be able to find your external IP, and I have, and I have blurred it out, of course. You may have noticed that my IP address is a dynamic IP address. This means my ISP can change my IP address whenever it wants. Um, this isn't good because if the ISP decides, hey, we need to change this IP address, your DNS record will break and you'll no longer be able to access your website from your domain. So there are different IP services that can allow you to kind of set a static IP address, even if your ISP doesn't want you to. Um, but the best way to do this is just to talk to your ISP and see if they can do anything about it. Luckily, in my case, I haven't had to do anything about it because my ISP hasn't changed my external IP address in over a year. So in my case, I don't really feel the need to go out of my way to get a static IP address at the moment. Now that we have a DNS A record pointing our domain to the external IP address of our internet router, it's time to point our internet router to the internal IP address of our Windows computer whenever it receives HTTP or HTTPS traffic. To do this, we use port forwarding on the router. So we will point ports 80 and ports 443 to the internal IP address of our Windows computer. There are many ways to find the internal IP address of our Windows computer, but you should be able to do it just from your router's admin panel. Depending on your router manufacturer, the port forwarding feature might be called many different things. On this TP-Link router, it is called virtual servers. Now that all the background networking stuff is set up, we can go back to our script and continue. This will install the requirements needed to enable SSL for secure remote connections. SSL is necessary when enabling remote connections to protect against man-in-the-middle attacks. The next prompts the script gives us will be to set up SSL. So the first thing that it asks us is to type in the domain name that we'll be using. So this will be the domain name that you set up the DNS record for earlier. Next up, it will ask you for an email address to send notices to. These notices include security and renewal notices, so you want to use an email address that you frequently check. This script uses Let's Encrypt to provide an SSL certificate, so it will then ask you if you want to agree to their terms of service, and then additionally it will ask you if you want to sign up for the Electronic Frontier Foundation newsletter. I'll agree to the terms of service, but I don't want to sign up for the newsletter at the moment, so I'll say no to that. And then it will ask you to select the domain you want the certificate for. And the domain that we added earlier should show up under the number one. So we'll just type the number one and hit enter. This will begin the certification process. And if everything went smoothly, you should receive a success message like the one I have here. If not, the script will pause so that you can read what went wrong. 
Now it will ask you if you want to redirect HTTP traffic to HTTPS, and in most cases you're going to want to, so you'll type 2 and then you'll hit enter. If everything goes smoothly, you'll get a readout similar to mine. The script will pause for you to read it if you want to, and then all you have to do is hit enter. Then the script will open your Nextcloud login page in a web browser. Now you'll just sign in using that Nextcloud login information you created earlier. So let me do that here. And if you notice up at the top, this has already redirected us to the domain we set up earlier, and it's already accessible from the internet. Additionally, it does show us our website is secure. So we'll just sign in here and ignore my password manager. All right, and we're in. So this is what the Nextcloud interface looks like, and this is what you'll be greeted with the first time that you log in. This little startup login window that you'll get will give you some information about Nextcloud, including the App Store, which is where you'll get the extra functionality that you'll probably be looking for. And it also shows you where the phone apps and desktop apps are available. Once we hit the start using Nextcloud button, we can then go in to view our files here in the file window. And it should put some test files in here for you. It also has a standard photo viewer like most cloud software does. Just to show you some other cool stuff that Nextcloud can do, we'll go up here to the top corner and go to apps. This will open up a huge list of additional functionality you can add on to your Nextcloud. Some of my favorites include the Contacts app, the Passwords app, and the News app. Lastly, to prove to you that our script set up Nextcloud properly, we will go into our settings here and show you that it is indeed using the cron scheduler and it has run recently. And we'll also go to the security check here and we have passed. Perfect. Thanks to our script, your Nextcloud instance will automatically start in the background whenever you boot Windows, so it should always be running as long as you have your Windows computer on. You can also manually start and stop your Nextcloud instance using the desktop shortcuts that are automatically installed through the script. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can leave your computer on all the time to have a constant sync with your Nextcloud instance, but you don't have to due to the way a lot of the Nextcloud client apps work. For example, you can open the Nextcloud Notes app on your smartphone and take a note even if your computer with your Nextcloud instance on it isn't running at the moment, it just won't sync until you turn your computer back on. This means in a lot of scenarios, you don't actually need your computer on 24 seven. All right, well, I hope this script takes the headache out of installing Nextcloud for many of you, and you can get it on our website, privacysystems.org. Not only do we sell this script, we also sell privacy phones and internet routers, and we also run a blog that talks about consumer privacy. So make sure to visit it if you're interested in that type of stuff. We also just launched a privacy auditing service for businesses where we go in and rate your company's privacy and provide feedback on how you can eliminate trust from the hands of external companies. That's all for this video. Thank you for your support. See you next time. <laughs>